Hello and welcome to Sky's the Limit and I'm your host Charmeen Ali. Uh, today on our program we've got with you a very highly uh, accomplished gentleman who uh, has been the head of one of our armed forces, the Navy. We've got with us today uh, the former Chief of Naval Staff, Admiral Asif Sandela. Uh, he's also the chairman of the Muawin Foundation, which promotes children's education in Pakistan. He's done an immense amount of work in that. Um, Admiral Sandela is also the recipient of numerous awards, such as the nishan e Military in Pakistan, and also the Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite by the President of France, and uh, he's also received the Order of Distinguished Rule of Mulaji by the President of the Maldives, and he's also gotten the Me Medal of Honor uh, in uh, by the President of Indonesia, and he's also gotten the Legion of Merit in the USA. That's a lot of honors to be received by one gentleman. We'll be talking to him about all of this today on our program. I'd like to welcome now our very special guest, Admiral Sandila, on our program. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us today and taking out your precious time. Thank you for having me here. So we'll begin now with um, your beginnings. Uh, you mention in a lot of your interviews, etc., that you come from humble beginnings, that you come from uh, a small town in Pakistan. Tell us about that, please. Where exactly did you grow up, and what did your family do? And you know, now what we see over here is an immense amount of success. So we'd like to hear about uh, how it all started off. Uh, I come from a very small, not a town, really a village in uh, district Shekhupura in Punjab. I started my education in a primary school, mm -hmm. uh, which I call uh, Tatwala school. Mm -hmm. No benches, no chairs. Mm -hmm. And of course, in those days, there was no electricity in our uh, village also. And uh, mm -hmm. my father owned land. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was also the, what you call, lumberdar of the village. Mm -hmm. So uh, family, that wise, uh, that way, fairly good to live comfortable life. Nice idyllic kind of life in, in uh, rural Punjab. Absolutely, absolutely. Of course, in uh, central Punjab, when we talk of land, generally the land holdings are not very big. Mm -hmm. But I would say that uh, my father and uh, our family, my mother also owned similar kind of land from her father. So it was a fairly comfortable life for all of us. Uh, I lived in my village and we were <coughs> two, I had two brothers and uh, one sister mm -hmm. and uh, I, I studied up to class five in my village. So that, that just seems like a very sort of um, idealistic life for a young person to be out in the fields and living in the village. Why did you want to join the Navy after that? Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, from my village I uh, went on to high school which was about four miles away. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I used to walk. This some is in Shekhupur. In she no, in uh, a, a town very close to my village known as Warburton. Okay. Uh, it was about four miles away and I used to either walk, bicycle, uh, or go by train sometimes. Okay. And then from there, I, uh, my parents in 1967 could afford to send me to Cadet College. And I went to Cadet College, Kohat. This was a competitive exam, and you had to get admission, and obviously, thank God, I went there. And from that uh, mm -hmm. village school, I was able to graduate to this Cadet College, and then all the life changed, and mm -hmm. everything changed. And from uh, coming from an Urdu medium school, coming to uh, Cadet College was a big shift for right. people like me. Uh, first, uh, first, when we went there, because everything was in English, mm -hmm. Uh, even the Quran uh, translation was in English and wow. it was uh, quite difficult to, uh, to tell you frankly. Right. But within about uh, five, six months we picked up and Alhamdulillah. What age exactly did you actually uh, start picking up? Twelve, uh, twelve, wow. twelve and a half uh, you go mm -hmm. and uh, 67 I joined. I was just, uh, let's say, uh, not even 13 mm -hmm. and uh, it was a boarding school yes. and of course uh, from class 8 to class 12th, I studied there. Mm -hmm. And while I was in uh, class 12th, now this is 1972, mm -hmm. uh, when we were still in the last year of our uh, uh, college, uh, the 1971 war, war took place. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of uncertainty in Pakistan. And uh, 
uh, we actually we were in cohort in those days uh, military selection was through ISSB and it was only in cohort okay. so we just went to see because we never thought uh, and the first information came was about the Navy so we went to we applied and we went and uh, luckily I qualified and uh, life went on but then the war took place and the situation became very fluid in Pakistan mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't very uh, uh, sure. I, I wanted to either uh, join the army mm -hmm. or become a doctor. Okay. But uh, uh, that was not to be. Mm -hmm. And when I qualified to become uh, to join the navy, uh, and there were some other friends of mine also, and uh, the navy officer who came to induct us to recruit us. There were three of us, we refused, uh, we don't want to join Navy. Mm -hmm. And I was one of them, <laughs> that I, will, I don't want to join Navy. Okay, so this wasn't like a love for the Navy? No, 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 not at all. At, the, okay. at that time, we knew very little about the Navy, okay. frankly telling you. We, uh, I must tell you, in 1970, I think it was, we went on an inter career colleges sports tournament, which took place in Pitaro, near Hyderabad. Okay. And from there, we went to Karachi and... Uh, we lived in the, uh, we were hosted by the Navy. And we went to visit a ship also, and it was so cramped, yes. so small, that uh, when we finished the round, the officer asked us who wants to join Navy. We were all cadets of, uh, let's say, 14, 15, 16 years uh, of age. And uh, most of us said, no, I, we don't want to join it's Navy. Tough living. It's yeah, tough living. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, after uh, we, uh, we said uh, we don't want to join Navy, then our principal called us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want uh, some of my students to go to Navy also. And you don't know this is a, he was a, uh, by the way, a retired colonel sub. Okay. And he had a lot of good things to tell us that you go in the Navy, that life is, you go all around the world and it's very exciting. And, and one thing more that uh, our naval officer at that time who came to recruit us, he said one thing, he said, uh, well, I've lived all my life in the Navy. Mm -hmm. If Navy wasn't good enough, I wouldn't let my son join the Navy. Mm -hmm. And my son has just joined the Navy. Really? So that, these were the two things which really make, uh, made me join the Navy. Yeah, and then right. life. Okay. So, all right. so then you, you went ahead and joined the Navy. Yes. And uh, what was that experience like? First, you go through the training here in, in the academies. Mm. And then after that, you are also sent abroad for some training mm. as well. And in those days, what really stands out, what I see of people of your generation and previous generations to that, my father's generation, who was also in the Navy um, and went to these kind of colleges, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on character building, grooming. Mm. You see that a lot in gentlemen uh, of mm. your uh, age group, your, you know, your particular mm. generations. What were you taught over there where you see such a stark difference between you know, one generation and the next? I would say it actually started for me and people of my age uh, from the uh, cadet college. Mm. Uh, over there it was a compulsory thing for you switch off the lights mm -hmm. when you talk to somebody talk to rightly mm -hmm. when you talk to some elder you must address them in that way right. when you eat there is a certain way to eat don't just jump on these things it all started from there and then we when we came to the navy navy actually was even more uh, uh, i would call it aggressive or more wanting to make these things happen that way the right way mm -hmm. and uh, you had to wear some dress at a particular time and you had to wear another dress at a particular time and obviously you had to uh, sports and pt and classes and there was a lot of emphasis on character building yes. to make a human good human being out of you Absolutely. so you can uh, well see from 12 years to then when i joined the navy we were uh, let's say uh, after five years uh, 17 18 years of age and um, again the same things in a more uh, a bigger dose to make you a gentleman to make you a good person and then to make you um, an officer in the navy mm -hmm. through all the training and i think that is what really i i would say uh, it stays in the cpu mm -hmm. 
uh, that we learned, and I must give credit to all our trainers. My, some of them have gone. Some of them are still here. I uh, owe our um, whatever we are to our trainers in the Navy and then in the college also. Who And of course, the primary school also where I started from. Had it not been a good um, foundation, I don't think I would have been able to make it to Kerala College. So all in all, I, I must, I owe a lot. Despite all that you've achieved, yes, you know, so yes. I have to say, I mean, that is another thing. Where does that come from? Is that kind of put into you throughout your training to be kind of humble also and not let it get to your head, all the successes mm -hmm. that you achieve along the way? I, I would say this comes, uh, this would come primarily from your, uh, even before the academy days when you are at home, mm -hmm. how your parents, uh, guide you, how they uh, make you uh, interact with the people who are elder to you mm -hmm. and not to be snobbish and not to be, and then of course when you go to the college and the Navy in particular, you are expected to be um, a gentleman, a humble, humility must be instilled in, mm -hmm. otherwise once you start taking I, I, so life becomes very difficult because in a ship, we don't work as an I, we work as a team. A ship, uh, maybe 150 people on board. So each and every one has a role to play in that running of that ship. It is not no one person. Yes, of course, the captain is the in charge mm -hmm. and he is the person responsible for all this. But all this happens because of a teamwork. Mm -hmm. It is only about uh, 250 or 300 feet and uh, uh, long if you see and all people 200 people stand you don't you only have maybe about a foot and a half to yourself mm -hmm. so you have to be that accommodative you have to be that hygienically that careful to be able to stay to be able to stay together with them in people. such close quarters to such uh, close uh, quarters yes so sir after the naval academy here um, then you went to dartmouth for further training and that's next level kind of grooming and mm. all of that so tell us a bit about that experience uh, what would they instill in you over there that those are places where princes yes, have gone yes Prince yes Charles, yes, for yes, example yes 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 um, things like that and uh, that was a time going to europe going to uh, england to to get your training it was a time when Pakistanis, and particularly Pakistani officers, had such a great deal of respect. Mm. So what was that experience like for you? Well, after the academy, um, when we joined. So uh, in those days, uh, only, not all of us went. There only from one class, there would be maybe two or three people who would go to Dartmouth. Mm. So I could say, I can say I was lucky that I got a chance to go. Mm. But going to Dartmouth was another level of learning. And uh, over there, uh, I would say things became more uh, uh, more organized, if I could say, or more, uh, where again, the same things. They would tell you how to sit when you are sitting and eating. And if there are ladies around, you don't, uh, you have to respect mm -hmm. uh, them and the way you eat. You sit together, you help each other, how you sail around, how you play around together and of course then the Navy, uh, uh, all the subjects of the Navy and, and navigation, science, seamanship and all these things. But I would say it was again uh, emphasized to be a human being and to be a good human being, mm -hmm. to stay humble, to learn what you are supposed to do, to learn. Mm -hmm. First you must learn and then you should be able to do your work. Mm -hmm. right. It is not enough to learn and not do anything. Or it is not enough to just keep trying and not learning. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn and you have to do your work. Mm -hmm. This is one of the very, uh, yes, I would give you uh, discipline over the students that were with us. Of course, we lived with, together with the Royal Navy officers and uh, we uh, all used to stay in one room and uh, but I found one thing was very uh, 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 challenging, I would say, or impressive, or they were much more disciplined than most of the other people who came from abroad. They were very, uh, whatever duty was given, they would try to do it to the best of their ability. Or I give you one example. One day we had gone outside and uh, we came back and uh, order was, you have to show your ID card to go in. 
and one of our uh, fellows, we lived in the same place, actually in the same room, and uh, he didn't have his card. And the other fellow who was also in our room was on duty. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, well, I forgot my card. Mm -hmm. He said, yes, I know. His name was Lester. Lester, I know you, who you are, but I can't let you go in because I don't have orders to let anybody go in without a card. So he let us all go and kept him. And he went after one hour or two hours. But what I'm saying is that very sure about duty. Mm -hmm. What is your duty? And then they make sure that they do it. And do it very honestly. Very honestly. Right. Very honestly. That, that is a big deal. Or, or implementation of the rule. Mm -hmm. Implementation of the rule and the law. That is. No, no breaking rules. No, no, no breaking. You couldn't imagine that. And then, like you said, discipline, which you have in all the forces, yes. uh, that is very much part of your whole life experience, whole life. is, is uh, discipline. And then, obviously, it also imparts down to your families as well. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Exactly. Yes, yes. So, uh, sir, you were trained as a navigator, and yes. then uh, you were also um, warships, uh, you were commanding warships, etc. Tell us about life at the sea. What is that like? You were just telling us about how life is on a ship. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Because it's, you know, you see army camps and you see mm. how people are living here on the ground, but on a ship, very few of us get to actually experience mm. what that's like. I've been able to go on a uh, Navy warship in the United States when mm. they come to New York Harbor mm. and for, it was open for tourists. So, I mean, the way it felt, it, like you said, it was so cramped and tiny and you know you have to go, go around these narrow passages and things like that and then when I, I think that my father spent years doing that and people like yourself have spent a lifetime doing that tell us a bit about that one thing more I would like to add here is uh, you would see less pomp and show by the Navy people mm -hmm. yes. and uh, when you are on the ship after you leave harbor you are out of uh, what you, uh, you can say out of sight out of mind mm -hmm. Even at times, good things don't get to be known by people. Mm -hmm. And some of the mistakes that you make may also be not known. Mm -hmm. And number two, uh, you uh, as, as a uh, general, uh, you try to keep your ship, or in particular submarine, very silent, mm -hmm. so that people are unable to detect you. Right. So, and this I'm particularly talking about. I'm not a submariner, but then we all work together. Exactly. So you try to be silent. You try to lie low, not to avoid detection. So perhaps that comes into the naval people's mind and they are not very, uh, what should I say, uh, making too much of noise mm -hmm. and staying away if you are away. Um, quite often your good things are also not very well noted. They kind of uh, lay low. Not that we don't uh, do when we don't yeah. work. Well, of course, if the enemy comes, we would hit yes. him and hit him very hard. <laughs> Life at sea, I would say, is... Um, well, uh, uh, any Navy officer would start at a very young age to be at sea. And uh, it is... Uh, I, I, I can... Uh, in short I can say it's a very exciting experience mm -hmm. to be at sea once you look at it's so vast the sea is so vast the ships have certain duties to perform so you are all the time actually more majority of the time you are busy and doing one thing or the other one thing or the other and um, of course then uh, it can also be when the sea becomes rough life becomes very difficult when you talk about uh, a ship being hit for example what what you normally get is very very few survivors because the entire ship kind of gets eliminated that's like ships during wars you see that they they take a huge number of casualties it is a very very sort of dangerous and risky line of work to be in when you know when there's a, a hostile environment so people don't tend to understand that being in the navy is not just about glamour no, no, and no, no, voyages no, no. and traveling and seeing ports and beautiful countries no, no, no. and all it's really you know when it, when when it gets really yes, hot and yes, things yes. become dangerous then ships can be very dangerous yeah right? they can be actually you see you look at a ship it has ammunition it has all, uh, fuel which are both very highly uh, combustible you have to be and of course the place is very very congested 
So uh, there is no room for error. Yeah. You have to be, try to be, of course, then there are incidents. There could be fire. There could be some other mm -hmm. things which can happen. But uh, then you are trained to overcome all this. Yeah. And uh, of course, we have a very elaborate system of damage control or firefighting on all naval ships. Mm -hmm. And the entire crew of the ship is involved in this activity when we are what we call action stations. Mm -hmm. So everybody, whether uh, the captain or the smallest of the person who even cooks food, he uh, uh, has to be on some duty, either supplying ammunition maybe. or th that kind of, or maybe in the fire uh, damage control and firefighting. So at that time, that is the priority. Mm -hmm. and then of course, uh, as you relax, then the things people stop. Some people can go and cook the food and also uh, the rest of can go and eat. But life is, uh, you have to be really very, very uh, sharp. And of course, uh, all kinds of people uh, are there. Uh, there will be some sharp, some mm -hmm. maybe less sharp, mm -hmm. maybe like me, who, who would. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, life is, uh, I can say, uh, driving a ship, firing guns, firing missiles, firing torpedoes, listening to sonars, seeing uh, <coughs> radars, and then finding who, where, what. So it is really a very uh, interesting life. It's fascinating. It's, it's fascinating. Like for for regular fact. people like yes. us who've never seen something like that, yes. except yes. when you go on a cruise, which is nothing compared uh, no, to... Actually, that, that is, the, you're just traveling, no? You're traveling, exactly. Uh, but uh, on the ship, when we are working, we are not just traveling. Mm -hmm. We are actually doing uh, exercises. We are. Uh, uh, doing firings, we are doing uh, various maneuvers and so many things. Yes. Right, absolutely. And uh, just uh, tell us a little bit about your voyages. What uh, stands out, the places that you've seen, for example, the ports that you've been to? It's a very sort of a romantic type of a, you know, uh, a life that you get to, you know, go to all these different unusual places. So tell us a bit about that. Then we went on a training cruise to the Baltic Sea. Okay. And we visited Sweden. Uh, Norway, Germany, Denmark. Mm -hmm. These are the places we went to. And that uh, has, because we were young, an impression on uh, all the time. Absolutely. Um, and then, after all, I have had several occasions to go. But I would like to point out two, uh, what we call in the Navy training, come uh, uh, training uh, uh, deployments. This is now 2004. When we sailed from Karachi, mm -hmm. we went to uh, Sri Lanka and um, Myanmar, Brunei, uh, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia. And our last port of call was Maldives, okay. 2004. We came to Maldives on two th uh, 25th of December. And the next day, 26th of December, 2004, tsunami hit okay. Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very, uh, I would say, a very memorable time for us. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, ships actually go up and down at sea. Very, it is nothing for ships to be waves come and go. <clears throat> On that day, I was, uh, I was the mission commander. Uh, we had two ships. Uh, the present naval chief was one of them, uh, captain of one of the ships. We were supposed to go and uh, visit the chief of staff of the Maldives Navy. And we got a call something like half an hour before going by our high commissioner that uh, uh, there has been um, some uh, water uh, which has come in and uh, uh, your call has been uh, po uh, canceled for the time being. At that time, nobody knew it was tsunami mm -hmm. in Maldives. And, and you were in the sea? We were at sea, in, the, in our ship. Didn't, you didn't feel any tsunami. You don't feel the tsunami when you're at the sea. Uh, because the ship went up and down. And down okay. So uh, used, used to it. Yeah. So uh, when uh, he uh, told us this, so I asked him, um, because there had been earlier in Maldives some wave upsurge with the water came in. Mm -hmm. And they had built some, uh, some uh, sea walls. Mm -hmm to protect. So they thought probably something like this has happened. So I told the High Commissioner, sir, we have helicopters, we have people here, we can probably go and help. And um, he said, yes, okay, let me. 
and within half an hour he came uh, and he said ke, yes uh, you they are going to request us officially so you can take permission from so i immediately rang up uh, in those days uh, satellite satellite phones had come i talked to the uh, uh, commander pakistan fleet and i asked him sir this is the problem here and uh, when he heard there has been some problem and the people are in distress and uh, there has been some damage to the islands also so he immediately told me okay go ahead take care of your people and yourself and your helicopters and everything and help whatever you can do so obviously he would have to he would have taken permission later on but immediately he told me so <clears throat> on the very first day when it happened by that time it started to come around the tsunami has come and uh, maldives is a country of islands and it's a basically a, a tourist country M many many people come and uh, immediately we sent our helicopter and sent some they said we are bringing food and medicine but nothing came so we put our own on the ships we have uh, food available which is uh, tin food and uh, medicines and we put in the helicopter and we requested them you please tell us where to go so they sent their people and we went around male and wherever they said we dropped these things so we came back that evening and so what did you see you you went on the helicopters you saw the island and there was yeah, devastation yeah, over devastation there. everywhere yeah, destruction yeah. at night they told us um, we want you to um, recover some tourists who were about 100 miles away from male okay. other islands and uh, you uh, i told them this is something like midnight and in male the ships can only come from sun rise to sunset mm -hmm. after sunset neither you can leave nor you can enter okay. so i requested them if we have to save life so it is emergency we have to go now mm -hmm. we can't wait till 6 o'clock in the morning next day so we have to go and then they gave us special permission so our ship sailed at night and it went about 100 miles off and uh, i i must tell you we picked up four 367 if i am not wrong uh, and they were from uh, europe from japan from america from france from everywhere and there was one pakistani couple also mm -hmm. that we picked up mm -hmm. and uh, later on i asked him two things i would like to say here and uh, he says uh, uh, everybody was talking uh, because you didn't know if there could be more waves you didn't know uh, how uh, what was happening but uh, he says this gentleman uh, uh, pakistani couple the gentleman when i talked to him i keep in touch with him uh, very deep. he was he's in uh, from shar now these days he's in uh, dubai and uh, he says i felt so proud when the ship which was coming to rescue people had a pakistani flag on it it was such a big uh, uh, thing for us to of course mother you could die you didn't know uh, what was happening another thing i would like to say when we picked up these people we brought them back to male and of course i met them and uh, uh, of uh, when uh, we brought them over some of them didn't have anything to eat for maybe more than let's say 12 hours or plus and even some people only had uh, Uh, bed sheets or towels around them even ladies had very little to because everything had gone vanished uh, and uh, uh, of course our people treated the people who needed treatment gave them clothes gave them food whatever we could uh, and gave them place to sit and of course and i asked one gentleman um, how do you feel and i cannot uh, forget his answer he was uh, from uk and he says uh, we generally haven't heard good things about pakistan mm -hmm. and uh, media doesn't say and some of us when we learned that pakistan navy ship is coming to uh, rescue us they were rather uncomfortable okay and uh, i said then how did you feel he says when we came on board we found people were so hospitable mm -hmm. they were just like us it is not what media has been telling us mm -hmm. so people uh, had lot of uh, uh, they gave us everything that we needed or whatever they had 
medical treatment, food, clothes. Gave, they, gave, they gave us place to sleep. Yes, and they were fortunate that you were there at the right we time. We were there at the right time. So that the, this was one, uh, one of the voyages that I would remember forever. You've also joined uh, in different uh, interactive activities with admirals and all from India. Mm. Uh, this is track to diplomacy uh, issues and all that you've been working on as an admiral, I believe, when you were in the Navy. And this was uh, to address incidents at sea and fishermen, etc., uh, those issues. Can you please elaborate on that and what was that achieving? This was actually my little role when I was Director General of Maritime Security Agency. Um, which is basically for law enforcement at sea, which looks after the fishermen or the fishing activities that take place, the anti-smuggling operations, anti-narcotics operations, and all everything law enforcement at sea. So a good thing at that time what happened was there are fishermen we catch, Indians, Indian catch ours, and there is a lot of... Because the borders are not defined. Exactly. Borders are not, no. in, with India, borders are not defined, and there is no line that you go here, this is India, or this is Pakistan. So these poor people go for fishing, and uh, they, and uh, uh, what we tried to do was that the fishermen should be able to be repatriated who come by mistake. Yeah by mistake. Of course, they are not all innocent also. There are people, other people also with them. Oh, sure. Okay. Other kind of people. So you screen them and uh, those who are, should be able to be repatriated. Mm -hmm. Pakistan does that fairly regularly, but India takes quite a long time to... And get. many of our fishermen are languishing there. Yeah, years. languishing for years and uh, many of actually have been mistreated in many ways mm -hmm. and uh, that was and one thing that happened when I was uh, of course it was happening before that we had a hot uh, line between uh, maritime security agent Pakistan maritime security agency and the Indian Coast Guard mm -hmm. and we would speak at that time uh, uh, the Indian uh, uh, gentleman was uh, I'm forgetting his name was a Parsi who would speak uh, Obviously, you are senior to me, and I uh, would speak very good Urdu, and uh, we would talk every week. And uh, once I told him, uh, 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 these people come and they fish in our area. And the next time when we went there, uh, astonishingly, we found that the people who were in this side, there were Indian Coast Guard ships telling them, don't go there. Mm -hmm. there this is Pakistani area, and you will be caught if you go there. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some kind of, uh, I would say, understanding between us that we should be able to be working together mm -hmm. for these fishermen. Right, and there was also a considerable amount of work on piracy. Piracy is one of the very old professions that is known. It is said that the navies came about because the people used to go and uh, uh, pirates used to go and take uh, whatever was on board. In those days, there must be small boats, not very big ships. And then the rulers and the rajas, maharajas, they said, no, whenever our boats are going, we should have some people to protect. And that is how the navies came about. But piracy, what happened in the recent past was from about 2007 to 2013, 14, was very um, off the coast of Somalia. Yeah, that's right. It turned out to be previously the pirates would come pick up whatever they uh, uh, wanted, whatever they found, and uh, left, and uh, they must have gone back and either used these items that they picked up. And they were targeting merchant ships. They were targeting mostly merchant ships. But in this one, they, it became an industry. Yeah. Industry in the sense, now they would take these ships, make the people hostage, and then ask for ransom. Right. And the ships had to pay millions of dollars mm. to get these people back. So this went on for several years. Then the whole world came. Of course, the regional countries came. NATO came. America came. Chinese came. Pakistanis, everybody. And there was uh, a task force made to uh, these, uh, protect these, uh, these people. And of course, but most of the big problem was uh, on land because these people would immediately call their people on either in London or Dubai that uh, this much uh, and it is very interesting that the money that all came 
very little went to the pirates. Rest of the money went to people who were either the financiers or who were backing. Or, right. So it actually was a very big criminal activity. But thank God, uh, the whole of the world navies came together. Mm -hmm. Some operated single-handedly, like Chinese or Russians. Um, uh, re uh, for example, under uh, uh, umbrella of the local uh, with the Americans, uh, that the navies were able to overcome this problem in about four or five years, right. which was a very big problem. Mm -hmm. And thank God, now you don't listen much about the piracy of Somalia. Right. And also the other roles of the Navy during peacetime, um, there's also uh, taking care of the sea lanes for the trade to take mm -hmm. place effectively. Mm -hmm. That's very important, as well as now go other ports. It's very, very important right now in this whole development of this region and CPEC, which we were talking about earlier. And that, again, is a huge responsibility for the Navy. I would uh, <laughs> say... CPAC minus Gawadar is extension of KKH. Okay. The road previously was from Khunjarab to, let's say, uh, uh, this uh, Habelia. Now from Habelia, it has gone all the way to Gawadar. If you take out the port of Gawadar, it is just more roads. But Gawadar brings another dimension to this. Mm -hmm. Another dimension is that the Gawadar port gives access to any uh, maritime traffic, maritime uh, uh, sh shipping activity that uh, the trade that will go on from Gawadar all over the world. And it's key. It's key. It's the Gawadar is the key. Mm -hmm. And thank God Pakistan Navy has been able to uh, uh, act uh, proactively and they have now formed uh, uh, task force to uh, protect the Gawadar port mm -hmm. and the approaches to Gawadar. Sir, now um, after becoming the naval chief and then eventually leaving the navy, you started a huge uh, sort of lifetime work which is totally separate from the navy and we have to speak about that right now, the Muawin Foundation. And you decided to go towards children's education and improving their education. What brought about this whole new focus in your life and how did this start? And tell us please about your foundation and the wonderful work that it's doing because it's having a massive impact and it, it has to be discussed because uh, it's wonderful and it's, it's a wonderful example for others to follow as well. This is a story of an American who comes to scale K2 okay. and there was a, 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 a lot of controversy about the book and the person. That is some separate okay. issue. But when I read this book, I just felt an American can come and do poor children's education in our country. But at that time, they had more than around 200 projects in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan in that region. Why can't I do? Mm -hmm. Or why can't we do? Yeah. So that the previous, uh, I told you, must be in my CPU somewhere. Th this one came, and I thought over it myself. And I decided myself that after retirement, I'm not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, in countries like ours, uh, when you retire from uh, reasonably senior positions, there are plenty of options available to you. Right. So I, I, uh, even the prime minister offered me at that time uh, that we could do uh, for you. Or I said, sir, thank you very much, but I don't want to do anything now. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, what do you want to do? I said, I want to now work on education of the poor people. Mm -hmm. So that is how we started. And our model really is, crux is, I, I, I say, uh, when you can make a child learn ABC, Aleph Bay, mm -hmm. 2 plus 2, and also be able to do some kind of skill development that he or she can earn something at night. Your model is um, very different from what a lot of people are yes. doing. You're not building schools. You're working no, no, with no. the current yes, government yes, schools, yes, 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 which yes. are in dire need of revamping. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're using their facilities, and you're sort of training their existing staff. Actually, uh, this is uh, many people are doing work and wonderful work in education. But I give it this example of uh, some people 25 years, and they have maybe something like 13, 1400 schools in Pakistan doing wonderful work. Wonderful. wonderful. But we say 
why we have chosen this because you don't need uh, land you don't need to buy land the schools are already existing the teachers are available so our main focus and we don't just walk into any school we have a mod, uh, uh, agreement with the government district administration and they are supposed to do certain things we are supposed to do certain things and the basic is on the software when i say software issue is in government school and that too in rural area teachers either there are no teachers if there are they don't come and if they come they don't teach and if they teach they don't teach well so this is the real issue now when we go to the doctor and he or she finds what is wrong with us it is not enough just to find out he or she gives us medicine to all so when we find this is the problem and there are many other problems this is not the only problem so we have to find a solution the solution is very simple every school you must make sure there are teachers available the government when we sign an agreement is supposed to provide us the teachers required in that particular school if there are no there are some shortage we hire them at our expense then we train all of them and train all of them at our expense with well uh, renowned uh, education schools like ali institute of education in lahore and uh, of course we pay that i will tell you little later we pay little uh, because uh, we, we, we went and met him uh, <clears throat> so we train the teachers we make the teachers available train them and then we supervise them our people go and check and of course i wonder maybe sometime i can take uh, but sab and you uh, and show you that in a village the school you go and see solar systems wow. tv videos audio visual aids, aids mm -hmm. teachers trained mm -hmm. and uh, of course then i say we have three must number one i have said about the teachers number two is every school that we go to must have functional toilet mm -hmm. and there are toilets always mm -hmm. but maybe some are old but in our school you will go and see all toilets will be functional and if they are less we build more third thing a must is mm -hmm. uh, drinking water every school that we and there are many people who are helping us for example bankal habib has given us an open check that wherever in the school you want we will make uh, arrangements for you it is not just like you bore you take water you test and then you make uh, filters and then uh, you have coolers and you can go and, and see safe drinking safe water drinking water generate. then solar systems then the furniture then the class teachers uh, uh, what should i say facilitation in many ways so uh, this is what we really focus and i i must tell you we started from my village two schools in 2015 girls school class 1 to class 8 mm -hmm. there were 140 girls mm -hmm. in 6 months these girls rose to 342 wow. the results of class 5 8 and 10 in the schools it went from 0 to about 60% to from about 65 to 100% mm -hmm. the boys school class 1 to class 10 there were only 180 boys within 6 months 370 now more than Uh, 600 mashallah the results again as i said uh, in the girl school so th that if the children are coming if the uh, results are getting better there are private schools which i don't call private schools actually they are making money and uh, they start to close so it looks like you are okay so i must tell you uh, how it really uh, then we have uh, one of our uh, colleague who has uh, vast experience of working with world bank her name is uh, ambreen arif i took her to my village and in my view what we had uh, that uh, i came from my village so we started from my village then we thought uh, we studied in kerala college kohat so we'll do some work there i spent my life in the navy so we'll do something coastal areas of sindh and balochistan and she gave us she came and she said sir don't make these polka dots now you should expand from where you are okay so from those two schools we went on to take a whole union council okay so, so concentrated in the same area the same area expand. i took another friend of mine who came from usa last uh, october and uh, he now wants to do two more union councils mm -hmm. 
uh, adjacent to our area. And he, they've already actually sent us about $200,000 to, we'll make, uh, first we'll repair all these uh, school uh, rooms, classrooms, washrooms, furniture, and then also build more where required. Then will come in the teachers hiring, the audiovisual aids, then will come the teachers training, and inshallah after about uh, August, September, we shall have uh, a reasonable. So starting from two schools, today we have 88 schools. Wow. Okay. 65 of them in uh, GB, hmm. 12 in Islamabad. Okay. But our Islamabad actually is not as much come up because COVID for last one year, we haven't been able to really work. Hmm. And uh, then we have four more schools in uh, uh, Jhelum, Pindadan Khan, and seven at the moment, but we will have about 12 to 14 more in Shekhupura. Actually, if I have a choice, where there is, I would like to expand this, mm -hmm. so that this becomes an excellence, a center of excellence for everybody. And of course, I will tell you about the vocational training also. And this, uh, but, when Sharmin wants to uh, do something, he will say, okay, I want in, in my neighborhood. So you, I, you forget about. So that is how we are in uh, GB. That is how we are in uh, Jhelum. That is how we are. So the people who uh, spend money, they then want you to work in a certain in area. Their areas yeah. So well. that is how Fair we are. Enough. Now I am convinced after about four or five years of work, we have an office. We have... Uh, uh, today we have over 25,000 students, something like, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, about a thousand teachers in all these schools and our schools are in remotest areas of GB to Shekhupura, to Jhelum, and of course we are going to work in Sindh. These are children who would not have had this quality education yes, before. Yes. And in addition to the education, you're also imparting them with the very critical grooming that we were talking about yes, earlier. Yes, yes, yes. Who better to be at the helm of that than yourself, who knows what grooming is all about and how critical it is, especially at primary, secondary stage. That's when you actually build the character of a child which I see is what is needed badly in our education over here in Pakistan. People are coming out with degrees, but at the same time, you know, they care for humanity, the environment, etc., cleanliness, this, that, noise, things like that is, is not there. So you're putting that... In. We are really making a lot of effort into this. Again, I, I would say that our teachers is the main. If we are able to train them and supervise them, they will be able to deliver. For example, we put in a lot of effort on morals and ethics. Mm -hmm. For example, environment, energy conservation, mm -hmm. personal hygiene. The boys and girls, as they grow, as a, at a certain age, body changes come in. And unfortunately, nobody trains these children. So we have a proper system whereby our teachers are trained by trainers who come and there are workbooks to tell girls and boys how to look after, after personal health, how to look cleanliness, how to do these things, self-awareness. Self mm -hmm. Somebody, we have every other day some problem of ch child abuse. It is not only in Pakistan, world over. So if somebody comes close to you, touches you, how should you react? Okay. All these things, we, we, we have a proper system and uh, we are working with many people. We have a large number of supporters, for example, in Shekhupura, uh, Chinese Consulate General in Lahore has done a lot of work for us and the building of uh, classrooms, computers, and with them we have come, come up with a model that they build, we don't take money. We say we don't want money, you please. Then Turkish uh, cooperate, Tika, uh, Turkish Aid and Cooperation Agency, they have done one school here in Islamabad, completely uh, refurbished, repaired, now they are going to do some work for us in Shekhupura, also some teachers training. And again, the model is that we don't take money. They will do everything themselves. Okay, so you have partners who, who do the work who with do the you. Work. Okay. Australian High Commission, they have a slightly different system. They have put solar system in all of our schools. And uh, that comes uh, because you are supposed to <clears throat> make 25% and they pay 75%. So. That is how we have put okay. uh, these solar systems. One thing more I would like to uh, say is we have also started skill development for boys and girls. Okay. We have now a proper uh, school where girls learn uh, uh, 
uh, beautician, mm -hmm. uh, dressmaking, boy is an electrician and motorcycle mechanic. If they get a job, great, it's very good. Or then we link them up with the Huwath and get them interest-free loan. So they Girl, can start a business. They can start a business. And there are many girls, particular girls are doing better than the boys. Boys also, but girls are actually doing better. Right. They either buy a sewing machine or two and then start working. The uh, beautician is the most popular. Absolutely. Even in There's the village. a huge demand. Huge yeah. demand. Every, and even everywhere. girls coming from my village now working in Islamabad, Lahore, Karachi, and the districts uh, and the cities close by. We started working with a stitching center. And what we do is we bring work. These girls do their work after the uh, expenses like the electricity and these things. We give all the money to these girls. Okay. Uh, and then we have also established a shoe stitching center. There is a uh, Siddiq Shafi leather uh, group, very big uh, uh, name in Pakistan, and they are exporters as well, and uh, they make urban sole shoes also. So they have established a center where they have put in machinery and the girls are, and we are focusing on girls really. Mainly, the, if the girls become independent, the life will change. Absolutely. Then they have something in their own pocket, they will probably the uh, problems that the girls face in our society. We can talk to you for hours and hours because there's so much knowledge to be gained from you and there's so much experience that you bring to us and really it's been a pleasurable, uh, very, a huge pleasure talking to you uh, today in our conversation and I'm sure that our viewers have also learned so much from you. I'd like to ask you for one last message now for the public uh, in Pakistan. Um, in light of the situation right now, there's a virus out there, there's a lot of turmoil in the world, etc. What would you like to advise uh, the public and especially the younger generation, which is a little bit despondent mm. right now? How can they improve things for Pakistan and as a result for humanity as well in light of uh, current uh, scenarios? My first message would be about uh, COVID, Corona really. Mm -hmm. So if Corona we take it is very simple. Now they are saying, wear a face mask, stay away, don't be too close to people, right. and keep washing your hands. And of course, now vaccination has come in, and uh, you must try to. This is real time. It is not just uh, conspiracy. It is. We have seen people dying in our own uh, neighborhoods. So, I my message would be to anybody and everybody: please take precautions. Be very careful. Don't go out everywhere and any time. Yes, we have to go out sometimes for certain things. But at that time also wear face mask all the time. Yeah. And be very careful. And my message to younger generation would be the young people that I go and talk, you must find ways to learn okay. education. Now, education, I can probably talk long, but it uh, makes up person a human being so that is what I call education and that is the role that people like us and you have to play to tell our younger generation the education to, doesn't necessarily just mean I could tell no 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 it's certainly a learning not voyage in life it is it is learning humanity it is learning being human beings it is learning how to help others, how to work with others. And I give example to mostly people, sometimes people ask me, I, uh, what is your um, uh, formula for success? It is very simple. Learn your job. Do your best. Do your best, Do your best and respect the people who are around you. Mm -hmm. right. I think this is the best formula. And uh, then uh, we need to be, what should I say, be helping, be working together, and if you and I can do something for somebody, do it. Right. Be in our small ways, whatever we can do. And I have now taken on that I try to do this education. And this is really, this is not my bread and butter. Mm -hmm. This is not my anything to do with, uh, alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Uh, you, right. Actually, I pay from my pocket for all this work. And um, It's the way you're giving back? It, it is the way of giving back. And this is my now uh, dream, I say, and I will use now Urdu. Uh, I started from my village, my, my dream is Pakistan. Okay. 
I hope one day that will happen, inshallah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Admiral Saab, for being on our program, taking out your time in these difficult times of uh, COVID. And um, we're very grateful that you were here with us. And uh, thank you so much. And best of luck in your endeavors with educating these children. It's fabulous. It's fantastic that you're, you're actually taking this upon yourself. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Sky's the Limit. Uh, today we had with us uh, Admiral Asif Sandela, who was the former Chief of Naval Staff of Pakistan. As if that was not enough of an achievement uh, for Admiral Saab, we've also seen him go on after his retirement to go and educate tens of thousands of Pakistani children and improve the current standards in government schools by taking on different government schools and improving them through teachers' education and bringing about technology, etc. So you can see that really the sky is the limit as far as uh, what we can do to give back to Pakistan, how much we can do to improve things here. So never feel down and despondent that there's nothing I can do as an individual. You've got examples right here of what individuals are actually accomplishing. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you at the same time, uh, same program, sky's the limit. Bye-bye for now.